Uh, first of all, I would like to acknowledge uh, and to thank uh, the organizer for the invitation. So indeed, I'm going to talk about uh, what uh, numerical modeling uh, can tell us about this uh, dislocation, mostly dislocation creep mechanism in, uh, in the earth mantle. Uh, you've got the list here of the name of all the co-authors involved in this, in, this, uh, in this kind of studies. Well, uh, talking about, when we talk about uh, creep mechanism, you know that usually we distinguish between two main mechanisms. The first one is diffusion creep, where point defect uh, diffusion is mainly involved in the deformation, and point defect diffusion can either occur in the bulk uh, of the grain of the crystal or through uh, diffusion on a grain, uh, grain boundary. And the second mechanism, um, it's called dislocation creep. Uh, where, where we have uh, dislocation activity. Just uh, so very briefly, a few words about uh, dislocation. Dislocation is linear defect. They do exist, as you can see here on this uh, TM micrograph uh, of dislocation in, uh, in olivine. Dislocation are characterized by uh, a burgers vector, which is the amount of shear carried by, uh, by the defect. And uh, so we distinguish usually uh, when the Burgers vector is uh, parallel to the line, we call it uh, a screw dislocation line. And when Burgers vector is uh, normal to the line, we call it an edge dislocation line. Uh, but uh, anyway, something very interesting is the fact that uh, if you look very close to the vicinity of the core, uh, an important feature is how atoms are exactly arranged near uh, the dislocation core. And you have here an high resolution TM micrograph of a dislocation. The dislocation is, is right there. Now, talking about uh, how this, can, this defect move in crystal, uh, there is two, two different, two different uh, motions. The first one is a uh, glide. When you apply stress on dislocation, the dislocation is uh, right there. You stress the dislocation, and it starts to move, and it moves in its glide plane. The second way for a dislocation to move is what is called Climb. Uh, climb is now what happens when dislocation emits or absorbs uh, point defect. So you have the dislocation there in its glide plane. Point defect is uh, absorbed by the dislocation, and you see that dislocation moves upward of the glide plane. Well, so both process uh, occurs in what we call dislocation uh, creep. And in the following of my talk, I will uh, mainly focus on this uh, creep mechanism. We talk about dislocation glide, or, and we will talk about also about uh, how climb can assist dislocation glide in further deformation process. And well, to do that, what we are doing is we are trying to develop a kind of multi-scale model for dislocation creep. And the idea is to couple two uh, different uh, uh, simulation uh, scale. The first is uh, atomistic calculation scale. So you have atoms, and we, you see the defect here uh, in the simulation cell. At this scale, what we look for is uh, definitely intrinsic properties of the defect, of the dislocation. So we look for uh, dislocation mobility, effect of pressure on this mobility, effect of temperature on this mobility. And once we have intrinsic properties of this defect, we transfer all these intrinsic properties to a mesoscale simulation which treats, in fact, the collective behavior of all your defects present in your, in your crystal. And usually this is done using what we call dislocation dynamic simulation. Uh, the acronym is DD. It's also at this stage that we introduce the climb of dislocation, as you will see uh, later. Well, the goal uh, is uh, at the end to try to say something about strain rate versus stress, to try to say something about uh, constitutive uh, equation rheological law. So let's start with um, the first uh, step of the modeling, so atomistic calculation. Most of the results I will show you comes from uh, mostly classical molecular dynamic simulation. So you've got here an example of a simulation cell. It corresponds to uh, more than 100 of thousands of atoms present, and we have a dislocation inside. As I said, we look, we look for intrinsic properties. Um, so we look to uh, what we call the core structure. It's indeed how atoms arrange near the core, but also we, we try to track the motion. So if you apply stress, dislocation has to uh, 
uh, in response to uh, uh, an applied stress dislocation has to overcome the lattice friction of the material. So the uh, lattice friction is here represented in, uh, in green, so you see this kind of valley. So, um, and we call that the payer's potential. So if you want to move this straight dislocation, you have to uh, push on it with a stress, which, uh, with a critical stretch, which, which is called the payer's stress. Uh, just very rapidly, a first example of uh, what is a, a dislocation core. It comes from dislocation in what's laid. Slip system is there. So that's the Burgers vector, that's the glide plane. And you see here the atomic arrangement of the dislocation in its glide plane. So the glide plane corresponds to uh, uh, this view. And the line is like this. You can see that uh, arrangements are rather complex. And we have here a dissociation into two partial. One partial dislocation there, one partial uh, other dislocation there, and in between a stacking fault. Whether it's uh, either complex, it exactly corresponds to what we see in TM micrographs. The same dislocation in TM micrographs reveals that indeed it's decomposed into two partials, as you can see here, with the two contrasts. So it's like we have two lines and a stacking fault in between. Um, to go further, uh, here you have a dislocation core, so it's an edge, you see the core there, perfect crystal, the dislocation is here. So now the line is going out uh, from, uh, from the board, and it's a, a dislocation in Bridgmanite. Uh, once we have this kind uh, of core, so the dislocation in the cell, well, the good thing with atomistic calculation is we can stress or strain the cell. And so if you do that uh, very uh, slowly, you increase the, uh, the stress. Uh, it's like this. As a function of strain, you have a stress-strain curve that goes up, goes up, until a point where whoop, you have a drop. And at this point, exactly there, the dislocation starts to move. So this point corresponds to the payer stress. For this stress, your dislocation moves as a straight line, overcoming uh, the uh, lattice friction. And also the good point with atomistic calculation is now that we can track how this payer stress evolves as a function of pressure. So once again, in Bridgmanite, two typical uh, slip system, and you see how the, str the payer stress evolves with pressure. So it's increased. You have a huge increase. It's classically what, uh, what happens. Uh, so pressure as an effect of payer stress, well, except if you have a phase transition when you change from one mineral to another. For example, here, when you go for, uh, to a post perovskite Yes, you see uh, in mechanical properties a huge drop, and uh, because payer stress in post perovskite are very low compared to uh, what is recorded in Bridgmanite. So this is a, really a weak phase from the mechanical point of view. OK, one question arises. Uh, how this payer stress compare with uh, experimental uh, data of flow stress? So here on this, uh, on this graph, you have uh, the flow stress plotted as a function of temperature, and here, all uh, experimental data. Uh, clearly, it's difficult to compare our calculation because our calculations are there, done without any temperature. So at this point, it's very difficult. The only things we can say is, OK, at least we are in a good trend. Uh, we have the right order of magnitude. Well, same conclusion for ringwoodite. We have less um, experimental data. The experimental data are there, and all payer stress are here. So if we want to go further, it, it's important now to uh, to try to say something about how this stress uh, evolves with temperature. But if we want to, to have a look to it, we have first to come back to the mechanism. In fact, when you have temperature and stress, this location doesn't move uh, anymore as a straight line, but it moves uh, by nucleation of kind of bulge. You see the line with the effect, uh, uh, the conjugate effect of both temperature and stress, the line starts to bulge over uh, the payer's potential. And we call that a king pair mechanism. The kink simply corresponds to this small part of the line that is really lying on, on the top of the, of the potential. Um, this kind of situation you know, is just a, a drawing, but we can exactly compute it. And we compute it, and uh, in fact, this kink, so uh, this uh, two, two piece of dislocation, costs you extra energy. And you can compute also the extra energy you need. Uh, so when we do that, uh, the amount of extra energy are there. It's, in, uh, again, an example in Bridgmanite. But also what you can compute is how this amount of energy will evolve as a function of applied stress, because the stress, of course, the work of the stress, as it's uh, shown in this expression, the work, uh, the work of stress will help you uh, to, uh, to promote this process. And now, uh, if we now take this uh, king pair energy as a function of stress, uh, simply this, this thing is very useful because it's uh, 
express the velocity of dislocation. In fact, your dislocation glide, uh, for the velocity of your dislocation, the velocity comes from the probability of this king pair nucleation. So the probability is given by the exponential term uh, here, where we plug this uh, extra energy. And in front, you have just a pre-exponential factor, which is the frequency of attempt of this process. OK, so we have velocity in glide for uh, dislocation. Uh, uh, to go a little bit further, what we can do is talk about uh, plasticity. So in fact, we, we have an equation, the overall equation, which links the strain rate uh, to the dislocation velocity. It's nothing less than uh, the strain rate is simply the number of dislocation you have in your, uh, in your sample times the Burgers vector times the velocity at which dislocation uh, move. And if now we plug uh, uh, the previous expression for the velocity inside, what we can do is to extract, to re reformulate this equation and to extract the stress and say stress will be function of temperature. So at the end of the day, you end up with this kind of expression where you have the flow stress function of temperature and all these parameters. I would like to point out that all these parameters here uh, simply come from atomistic calculation. There is no fitting parameter at all. And you know also the good point is that with this kind of calculation now we can also say something about the effect of strain rate because the strain rate is in fact is there. It's hidden in, in this C constant but the strain rate is there so I will show you what can be the effect of strain rate uh, a little bit later. So now let's uh, use this expression and compare this expression coming from atomistic calculation with experimental data. Uh, so the result of our calculation are this uh, blue or red line. It's in, in ringudite, and you, you compare with experimental data. It's in amazing how we can really match uh, the decrease of the flow stress as a function of temperature and goes through the uh, uh, experimental data uh, for the, the slip system in, in ringudite. The same, we can do the same for what's light. You have the result for what's light. Once again, you see that we have not only good order of magnitude, but the right decrease. Uh, or for bridge manite, where uh, you've got uh, the few experimental uh, flow stress points uh, coming from uh, this, uh, this experiment, and the result of our calculation in, uh, in green for two slip system. Also, on this, on this plot, so the flow stress as a function of temperature, I put the result of our calculation for magnesium oxide just to highlight that indeed we can, with atomistic calculation, recover the contrast in strength into, uh, in between uh, periclase and, and bridge manites. Well, I say that um, we, we have the strain rate, or we can track the strain rate effect. So it's, uh, again, it's uh, the stress uh, for dislocation to glide in what's height plotted as a function of temperature. You see this, this value comes from uh, the previous graph, where we use a typical laboratory uh, strain rate. But now, if we change in our calculation, if we change the strain rate, so we decrease strongly the strain rate, you see that curve uh, shift, and this corresponds to, in fact, uh, for a given temperature, to a decrease uh, of, the, uh, of the stress needed for, uh, for the glide of dislocation. However, uh, it's what's laid, so if we stay around, uh, let's say, uh, 1,000, 1,500 uh, Kelvin, uh, we see that uh, whatever we, we do, even if we decrease the strain rate, the, value, the amount of stress you need to apply for further glide of dislocation remains quite very high of uh, at least uh, 500 megapascal. So it's still very high stress. Anyway, so at this stage, we have, I think we can be confident because we match with experimental data, so we can be confident in, into our atomistic calculation and especially in the velocity we extract from this atomistic calculation. So the next step, as I said in my introduction, is now to transfer this to uh, the mesoscale simulation. Um, here, just we need also at this stage to introduce climb velocity. So uh, just a small reminding that climb, uh, climb velocity Climb process, it's simply when a dislocation absorb or emit a point defect. It means that the velocity uh, at which dislocation goes away from uh, its glide plane will be function not only on the stress, you've got the stress here, but will also be a function of uh, self-diffusion uh, coefficient. Okay? Uh, and if you assume steady state condition, constant vacancy concentration, 
then you end up with this, with this expression. So now, in our simulation, we have two velocity, one uh, velocity for dislocation glide and one velocity for dislocation climb. The first thing we can do is just to have a look of the interplay, because there will be an interplay between these two, uh, these two kinds of velocity. Uh, um, yeah, so to, to look at this interplay, I uh, will start to uh, say something about olivine. Um, so what, we, what you have here on this map is uh, the ratio, we plot the ratio of glide velocity over climb velocity as, as a function of both stress and temperature. And if you look to uh, the scale here of the color code, you see that uh, glide velocity will be whatever the temperature or the stress will be order of magnitude faster than climb velocity, uh, which is basically what you can have in mind because, as I said, climb involves point defect diffusion. Okay? So now let's see what happens uh, when we run the simulation with this uh, kind of velocity uh, for the dislocation. So yeah, um, we have a mesoscale simulation where we put dislocation. The typical snapshot of the simulation is there. Dislocation are the small cross you can see here. So now dislocation are again, you, you see the dislocation line uh, uh, like this. And we, we start to deform to apply an external stress uh, to the sample. If we have only glide of dislocation, very you start to produce strain, so it's a red curve here. You produce plastic strain, but you reach uh, very rapidly a point where well, you cannot produce any more plastic strain, simply because you develop a microstructure, and all dislocation inside your microstructure are now locked. Nothing more can happen. So if you want to produce more uh, plastic strain, if you want to go further, you need something else. And something else is you need, to, you need that dislocation escape from the glide plane so climb. And indeed, if we introduce climb, it's now uh, the blue curve here. If we introduce climb in the simulation, well, uh, there is climb event, and climb promotes the uh, deformation process of, uh, of the sample, as you can see here. So now from this curve, because we plot here the plastic strain as a function of time, we can uh, end up with uh, the, uh, the strain rate uh, for a given uh, condition of applied stress. Something I would say uh, also, uh, I would like to add that uh, now, uh, again, as it's a simulation, you can try to, to extract important features of, uh, of your simulation. So if we now compare uh, the uh, amount of strain produced by glide and the amount of strain produced by climb in this kind of experiment, you see that climb do not produce any, any strain. And all the strain comes from uh, the glide. However, Climb is very important because it's a mechanism that allows dislocation to further move and deform, uh, and deform your sample. And this kind of uh, creep, uh, dislocation creep mechanism is known for a while, and it's called uh, usually the Wirtmann creep uh, process. Okay, so uh, now uh, I move to uh, lower mantle, so uh, same exercise with, but with a uh, Bridge manite. First thing, let's have a look to uh, once again the velocity for dislocation in, in during glide process and the velocity uh, in climb process. Bridge manite, 30 gigapascal of uh, pressure, so lower mantle condition, I would say. Uh, same map temperature as a function of stress. Uh, just now, uh, have a look to, uh, to the scale there. Uh, if we compare to uh, what we have in mind for olivine, in case of Grinchmanite, we have only a very small window here at very high stress where the glide is more uh, fast, is much more faster than a climb process. So in, if you do experiment in, in this uh, very small window, you expect to, to find dislocation creep process uh, quite equivalent to what we have seen in, uh, in olivine, for example. However, uh, all the other part of the map is simply dominated by uh, this quite a purple uh, color, which means that whatever the condition in this second window, dislocation doesn't, in bridge manite, dislocation doesn't glide at all. And in fact, it doesn't glide because to glide, dislocation will require in bridge manite very high stress. So it cannot occur, and you are simply left with climb 
of this location. So now the question is, okay, um, do climb, and we can call it pure climb because it's the only uh, process for your dislocation, um, can pure climb produce deformation, strain uh, and produce further deformation of, uh, of bridge manite sample? So once again, we are back to uh, the, kind, the mesoscale simulation uh, where we, for bridge manite, we put two types of uh, dislocation, so the blue and, uh, and the red one. It corresponds to Burgers vector uh, 100 or 010 uh, in, uh, in bridge manite uh, PBA name uh, structure. And snapshot of the um, simulation cell are given here. Uh, you recover the, the stress the stress field of this location uh, with this uh, with this color code. Anyway, so now we uh, we apply this condition during the simulation: a low stress, uh, high temperature, and the pressure. Uh, this is the pressure uh, applied. And you see that after a transient, uh, if you look to the uh, the strain as a function of time, you see that after a transient, we end up with. Uh, a nice uh, constant strain rate uh, simulation. So what we can do is uh, change now condition in, uh, in stress, in applied stress. So we vary the applied stress and we plot the result of strain rate as a function of applied stress. So it's here uh, what you have. You know, the strain rate function of, uh, of stress for quite low stress, below 100 megapascal. Result of pure climb process are given by these two red uh, lines. So it's different, uh, different type of simulation. And the difference between the two simulation is the dislocation density we initially input uh, in the system. But what we, what we see is uh, with this pure climb process, we can see that even at very low stress, uh, 10 megapascal or uh, 100 megapascal, we are able to reach strain rate uh, of the around of 10 to the minus uh, 15, uh, so quite close to what we can expect from uh, lower mantle. Something else that we can do, I say uh, in my introduction that there is not only, uh, here we talk about dislocation creep, but there is also diffusion creep. If you want to reach uh, for the same value of stress uh, uh, this kind of strain rate, considering uh, diffusion creep, it's perfect. Um, then, um, you, if you apply a number of ring uh, e e equation, you see that to reach the same amount of uh, strain rate as a function of stress, you need to consider a uh, very small grain with a grain size uh, below 0.1 uh, millimeter. So, if grain are Larger than 0.1 millimeter, this kind of climb process will be much more efficient than uh, diffusion, purely diffusion process. Okay, so, uh, uh, no, wrong way. No. Well, this one is uh, okay. So now, uh, what I think is uh, that this, this pure climb creep process, I think it's a very important uh, mechanism for uh, deformation in planetary uh, interiors and especially in, in lower mantle. And uh, I would like to add a few facts about it. Uh, with this process, strain will be produced by climb of dislocation. And as a consequence, as there is no glide, uh, the consequence is that we do not expect any crystal preferred orientation because there is no rotation during climb uh, of dislocation. Uh, another important feature for this kind of uh, uh, creep mechanism, pure creep mechanism, is that there is no grain size dependence. And that, of course, uh, everything will be controlled by diffusion because we need diffusion of point defect to climb. However, uh, it is definitely not sure that the rheology uh, may be linear or not. And this point, we, we, are, we are still uh, working on this point. And so now, uh, with this, just a, a summary uh, of my conclusion that uh, we are now able to start uh, from the atomic scale and to say something about uh, the collective behavior of dislocation. And what happens for lower mantle, it's we think that creep may definitely involve a kind of pure climb creep uh, process. And with this, thank you for your attention.